and, and this is really a personal thing, what, what helped me most as someone who was not a natural writer and who had to work on it, but was in a position where I had to write. So I, I first, what helped me is that I, I was passionate about the message I had to deliver. I wanted, you know, I was angry about things, excited about things, and wanted to convey them to them and persuade people. Um, I wanted to influence others. Finding a critical encourager, someone who believed in me and was willing to put the time in to help me improve uh, was incredibly important for me. And uh, particularly, I thank one, one person who I worked for who, who, uh, who invested that time in me. And then finding outlets which to write in that were appropriate to my skill and style. And then um, becoming an editor later on and then being able to shape a publication was really helpful. Getting involved in social media and then starting my own blog. I was a very active blogger for about, oh, about six or seven years when I was at, at CMF. I was probably writing about 20 blog pieces a month on, on average uh, at, at the peak. So I, and, and that really helped me to, to uh, grow and develop in, in the writing. Getting into a position of influence, and it might be if you're the leader of an organization or a pastor, then maybe people are more likely to read your stuff unless it's very bad. Uh, but you don't have to be in a position, of, in a position to have influence. And, and some, of the, some of the best writers did not start off that way. And what um, things like YouTube and blogging have done is that they've given an opportunity to people who are great performers or great writers, but who are not in any recognized position actually to get uh, recognized. Uh, making a regular commitment to write. So the golden rules of how to get published. Go to the appropriate publication who are going to publish the kind of things you're writing in, because you're writing on subjects that interest them, and you're putting the views that they're interested in promoting. Write to length. Meet the deadline, write clearly and colourfully, and then uh, use the in-house style. The major reason that people don't get published uh, who, is because they don't write to length, and they miss the deadlines, and they don't use the in-house style of the journal. Which, and and what, what that means practically is that the editor gets the piece, and they feel this, their heart sinking and they're thinking, oh no, this is going to be a couple of hours of my time. Or, you know, I'd far rather le read with this author who might not be as good, but he always sends in exactly the number of words I've asked for, always on time, and I'd, I have to do very little work in getting it up to scratch to put into the magazine. So it's a big mistake people make, is you, you just follow those simple rules of writing to length, meeting the deadline, and using the style. Uh, far more likely to get published. So um, every magazine will have, or every journal or every book will have its in-house style. In other words, the way it handles references, quote marks, uh, dashes, the kind of spelling it uses, if it's in English, whether it's American or British English or whatever. And so if you're writing for a particular publication, you should either ask for a copy of their in-house style document, or you should look at other articles that have been published and follow the same rules, particularly within referencing as well, so that you're not leaving a lot of work for the editors to do. I mean, it may, you may say, well, it shouldn't, it shouldn't depend on that. It should just be the quality of my writing. But actually, you know, it, we, we have to be practical. And I think it's part of, of good Christian stewardship to try and make things as easy as possible for the editors you're dealing with, just because it shows them respect and it shows them that you're willing to invest time, uh, plus it making their life easier. And especially when they're working against very tight deadlines, they just really appreciate people. And you, you get to know this as an editor. You know, you know, you're more likely to ask for a piece from this person or this person or this, because you know it'll be well written, the right length, it'll need minimal editing, and it's going to fill a space in the journal you know, against a tight deadline. How to get provocative titles, logical structure, uh, social media, of course, has given us an incredible opportunity now uh, uh, to promote and get things out into the public square, which otherwise wouldn't be 
noticed and uh, using others who will promote you as well. So um, I mean, th this may sound terrible capitulation to uh, millennial culture and so on, but there's no question having a Facebook page is really good for propagating stuff you write. The other thing is a, a Twitter feed as well. And, and if you're if you're a younger generation, then Instagram and so on is is going to be the thing. But think about where your audience is is going to to be. So just a few, these are just a few examples of blogs, which uh, I hope illustrate this. So th the point here is a title: Twelve Good Arguments Atheists Advance Against Christianity. So who am I wanting to read this? Atheists. So I frame it in such a way that it will attract them. They think, oh, here's a Christian writing about how wonderful atheist arguments are. You see, so I'll come and read this. And then so I'll, I'll put it out on Twitter and I'll put on it hashtag evolution, hashtag atheism, hashtag anti-Christian, hashtag, and then I'll, I'll send it to Richard Dawkins or something like that, you know. So, and, and the whole idea is you, you Hashtag sex, you know, and, and people will, will come in uh, and, and in droves and, and read this. And so this was an article that, that got a huge audience from atheists, uh, the ones I was trying to read. So this is another one. Still, why Christians may eat shellfish but may not have sex outside marriage? Because it's a common question that atheists will ask. Now, I, think, I happen to think the article was quite good, but what made people read it was the headline. And uh, on Facebook or Twitter, you know, they're going to they're come. This was another one, Defending the Indefensible, 20 Reasons to Think Twice About Aborting a Baby with Anna Kefli. Uh, again, I put this out on social media. It got, into the, it got into a group, to two groups of people. The first group were women who had children with Anna Kefli and had decided to keep their babies. And, and they came, this got into the whole network and they all came back and, and started telling all this. Incredible stories. It was amazing. And then the other group that got interested were journalists. And so I was being phoned up by journalists to come and speak on this issue. And I got, I got, um, uh, I got uh, a whole half hour in a, in a talkback program with just me and the interviewer on BBC Belfast um, just to talk about this subject, where in effect I was given the platform to, to do it. Now, I'd never had that opportunity if it hadn't been for the article, but it, was, it wasn't the article, it was the headline that got. So 10 reasons, 20 reasons, or whatever. It, often, it, you're just trying to draw people in. This was another one. Um, do you know what happened to the girl in this iconic Pulitzer Prize winning photo from the Vietnam War? Now, everyone, particularly of a certain generation, will know this story. This story. But, um, and I, I heard this woman speak. Uh, she's a Christian believer. It's an amazing testimony about how she got converted. And I heard her speak at a church in New Zealand. And I just took notes during her talk. And then I went away and researched a, a few things on the internet, got a bit more information, and then just wrote it up into a thousand word blog. But I got the picture and the title uh, and then just put it out there. And uh, what happened is that um, it went out on my own Facebook page, was picked and tweeted by others. But in particular, what happened was that it got into the, into the Southeast Asian community, uh, Facebook community. So just, you know, here's some examples. So what happened to the girl? You can see 165,000 page views. But that was just on my blog. And I know that there were other sites who then republish this stuff without permission, but that doesn't, you know, nothing like, there's no such thing as bad publicity. And, and they were reposted on blogs and were getting millions of views for the same thing. And so you think of your blog as a launch point that people will then, if it's interesting enough, will take it and republish it on things that have a farther reach or journalists or read it and, and so on. So, 12 good arguments, atheists advance, 139,000 uh, page views on, on the blog. Why Christians may eat shellfish, 83,000 page views. I, I did one, for example, uh, I, I wrote a blog called The Slaughter of the Amalekites, Was It Justified? Question mark. And I sent it out to, um, you know, hashtag atheism, hashtag evolution, and so on. 
but, but I put at Richard Dawkins as well. And so Richard Dawkins then retweeted it to his 100,000 followers. So I had a whole horde of atheistic trolls arrive uh, on the website. And of course, a lot of them were writing very rude things, but I'm, I'm not bothered if, um, you know, if, if 80,000 atheists will come and read the article or react to it or something. So the, the aim is you're just trying to, to get them to get them there. It, the, the final plug is, is um, think also about giving a platform to others. And, and I think my, my own testimony was that I did a reasonable amount as a writer, but then I actually started to realize that I could give a platform to other people as well. And so, um, you know, we're, we've done our 105 <coughs> uh, global webinars. I haven't spoken at any of them, but I've hosted them and got the people in. And, and you see, you can, they say there's no limit to what you can achieve if you don't mind who gets the credit for it. And, and you, if you can discover someone who's writing on something that's really passionate to you, but, uh, and they've already done the hard work, then rejoice that that's something you don't have to do and think for something else you can. But think also about how you can promote those people to the, the following that you've, you've got. Uh, and also, um, so what, if I read something good, and I think oh, this is a great thing that people should read, then I just you know, pop it up on my Twitter feed or on Facebook or whatever and um, try and get it into uh, bigger arenas. So you can tweet other people's material, post their material on your blog, commission an article for them, you know, or finally, but that's the final line, run a seminar like this. So if this has been useful today, then please take the material and use it elsewhere to encourage others to develop in their, in their writing. You know. um, we have a saying in medicine that, that um, if you copy from one person, it's plagiarism. But if you copy from many people, it's called research. And so uh, if you like, Christian theft is where you take great ideas and give them a bigger platform. Of course, you can acknowledge. And nothing I've said here is original today. And if any of it has been useful uh, for your own practical use, but also for others, then please do. You've got the, you've got the notes and the, the PowerPoint to go away and read it.